And let's begin with prayer. Lord, we ask that again you would speak to us as we open up your word. It has been so good. We've been learning so much. And above all things, Lord, we want to we learn this morning that we can trust you. And that we don't na- need to take steps in our flesh. We don't need to try and work out things on our own. But we need to wait on you. We need to trust you. And we need to realize that nothing is impossible with you. So I believe and I pray for all things we would get that this morning as we look at this passage. So bless your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Genesis chapter 16. We'll be looking at three chapters this morning. Now, there was an elderly man and his wife. Uh, Elderly, I mean, they were married 70 years. That's a long time. And they had a friend of theirs over the house, and the friend noticed that every single time this elderly man made a reference to his wife, he was so endearing. He'd call her honey, and yes, dear, and pumpkin, and sweetheart, and he just thought, Wow, that's pretty amazing. 70 years of marriage, and he still treats his wife that way. And so she had left to the other room to go get, you know, some food. And and, uh, while he was gone, this man asked his friend, he says, you know, I'm just blown away by just how endearing you are to your wife with all these names, Pumpkin and Sweetheart. And, well, the elderly man kind of put his head down. He says, well, I've got to be honest with you. I forgot her name 10 years ago. So... (laughs) As uh, we come to Genesis 16, we come to another elderly couple, Abram and Sarai, and, and they didn't forget one another's names. It was worse. They forgot God's promise. They forgot God's promise, and what they do is they take a spiritual detour that not only affects them, but affects the Jewish nation even to this day. So you're going to see that as we move through here. Uh, let me say this. Chapter 15 left us on a high note. We had that unconditional promise to Abram. I'm going to bless you and make your descendants like the stars of the sky. But as we come to this chapter, Abram and Sarah are trying to fulfill that promise in the flesh. And, and it reaps really a disaster. So let's jump into verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Remember the promise is you're going to have many children, but he had none. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Now remember, uh, back in chapter 12, remember Abram took a a detour. He went down south to Abram, which represents the world. And when he came back, he brought some servants with him from Egypt. And just as he had taken Lot with him, and that proved to be a mistake, so now this would prove to be a mistake as well. Because Sarah said to Abram in verse 2, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. So he's essentially saying, why don't you marry Hagar, and she could be a surrogate mother. And according to that, that, that time period, the custom of that day, had she had a baby, it would not be hers, Hagar's. It would be, in fact, Sarah's, because she was a servant. We would also note that in those days, uh, the surrogate mother would usually give birth to the child on the knees of the barren mother. To signify the fact that this is your child. Now, this tells us also, uh, by the way, Sarai is 75 years old at this time. So she's past the age of bearing children. But evidently, at 85, Abram was not, which is pretty amazing. So God wanted the two of them to trust in him. And they would have a child together, but they bypassed that. And we read that Abram, verse 2, heeded the voice of Sarai. So he succumbs to the flesh, both of them. Now there's an interesting verse in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12. It tells us through faith and patience we inherit the promises. Through faith and patience. They lacked patience. Isaiah 28 and verse 16 says, He who believes, he who trusts God will not act hastily. But they acted hastily. And so we see the results. Then Sarai, verse 3, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. So she becomes pregnant. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. So Hagar saw her pregnancy now as an opportunity to make herself look better in front of her mistress. Keep in mind that in that culture back then, if, if you're a woman and you could have no children, it was practically considered a curse. So Hagar is kind of flaunting her pregnancy to make her mistress seem less of a woman. Then Sarai then said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. 
Now, she's blaming Abram. Now, Sarah is just as much to blame. But certainly, as the head of the home, Abram, you know, carried the, the fuller weight of responsibility. He should have said, no, that's a mistake, but he didn't. So Abram said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. Got a problem, you deal with it. And when Sarai had dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now, think about this. Prior to this moment, Abram had peace in his home. He had peace in his home. He had peace, actually, with the nations around him. Remember, he had won a victory. But now, because of sin, he has war in the house. Hagar's angry at Sarai. Sarai's angry at, at Hagar. Uh, Sarai's angry with Abram. Abram is frustrated. I mean, the home is anything but peace. It's a place of contention. It would have been a lot easier just to wait on the Lord. You know, sometimes we think a shortcut is better. No, that's not always. Certainly when it comes to waiting on God. You know, there's some people would, who would think, well, wait a second, doesn't the Bible say God helps those who help themselves? They were just helping out God. No, the Bible does not say that. In fact, that's a mistake when we step in. Now, Sarai begins to deal harshly with Hagar, and we read that she fled from her presence. So she flees from uh, Sarai, and she's really trying to flee from her problems. Maybe even flee from God. Thanks a lot, God, you know. Sometimes we're like that. We're just, I got to get out of here. I've, get away from this whole thing. We think we could flee from our problems. I, I think of Psalm 139 where David said, you know, I, I can't flee from what God allows in my, my life. God's there all the time. He's allowed it. I mean, if I go up to heavens, he's there. If I go down to the center of the earth, he's there. If I went to the depths of the ocean, God would be there. So the better thing is to deal with it. But she takes off, and in verse 7, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. Now this is heading uh, south, so we know that she was now heading back to Egypt, back to her homeland. And she's intercepted by this angel. Notice capital A in your Bibles, angel of the Lord. Many uh, theologians, scholars would believe that this is a Christophany, another pre-incarnate visitation of Christ, and that's why it's a capital A. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, by the way, isn't it interesting? She, the, God doesn't even recognize her marriage to Abram, but here's Sarai's maid. Where have you come from and, and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. That's a tall order. I now have to submit myself to her? It hasn't been easy. Yeah, but you started. You started flaunting, you know, oh, I'm pregnant, you're not kind of a thing. But go back, submit to her, humble yourself. But then God gives her an interesting promise. The angel of the Lord said to her, verse 10, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And by the way, God has fulfilled that prophecy through the Arab nations. So God fulfilled this promise, and the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. The name Ishmael means the Lord hears. So the Lord heard the affliction of this servant girl, and that would be his name. By the way, the name Ishmael is the first man in the Bible given his name before he's born. First time. Again, the book of Genesis, origins or beginnings, a lot of firsts. <clears throat> now, God begins to describe this man, though. He shall be a wild man, verse 12. It literally means like a wild donkey. His hand shall be against every man. And every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. So he's now describing Ishmael and his descendants. Uh, if you have an NASB translation, it puts it this way. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live to the east with all of his brothers. So here we have a description. This, you don't want to broad brush every person born in the Middle East. But here we would recognize that certainly the Arab nations, their hand is definitely against the Jewish people and against most of the world who would not agree with their philosophy. And they would, you would say that their, stubborn, their descendants are, like he says, stubborn and resistant. That's a good description. That was a prophecy. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said... Have I also here seen him who sees me? So here we see that God not only heard her affliction, 
But God saw it, the God sees. So he, she calls God, you are the God who sees. Therefore the well, the spring where the Lord met them, verse 14, was called Bir Lahai Roy. Literally the well of the one who sees. Observe it, it's between Kadesh and Bered. Again, that's on the way down to Egypt. But here I would say that, that Hagar herself learned some things about the true and living God. One, that he is a God who hears our cries. He heard her cry. And he is a God who saw her affliction. And he's even a God who met her need. And I would say that we need to remember that our God is the same. The true and living God is one who hears our cries. One who sees our afflictions. One who wants to meet our needs, if we will but seek him. So in trusting God's promise, Hagar returns to Sarai, verse 15. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. So he believed that God did speak to her, and he names his son Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. Now, I want you to hold your finger here, and I want you to go to the New Testament to Galatians chapter 4. So that's a good journey. We're going to go near the end of your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 4. And the reason why is because we have a commentary here about this man Ishmael and about the son of promise who will be born soon, and his name is Isaac. So Galatians chapter 4 and uh, verse 22 and I'll start reading. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, that's Hagar, the other by the free woman, that was Sarai. But he who was of the bondwoman, that's Ishmael, was born according to the flesh. It wasn't God, that was the flesh. We got to help you out, God, right? And he of the free woman, that's Isaac, who will be born shortly, through promise. And then he says this, verse 24, these things are symbolic. So now we learn something, that God allowed that, and this is really symbolic. Ishmael represents the flesh. Ishmael, the birth of this child, represents trying to do things in your flesh, trying to do it your way, trying to help God out. And in contrast, you have the son of promise. That's relying on God's promise. That's relying by faith and in patience, trusting in God. So we have a contrast here. The Bible tells us, concerning the walk of the flesh and the walk of the spirit. And that's why Paul later on, after laying out this whole story, goes on in Galatians 5 and verse 16 and says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because if you don't walk in the spirit, you're going to stumble and you're going to birth Ishmael's. How many of us have birthed Ishmael's? Anybody? I think we all have. I think we've done it far more than we'd like to admit. Oh, God, I got this. I mean, I've been praying about it for a week. <laughs> or I've been praying for this for years. I need to help God out. Now this is what I'm going to do. This is what we're going to do, honey. You know, we, off we go doing our thing. We all fight the temptation to do it in the flesh. You know, it's interesting, though, as you study the Bible, and some of you have read through the Bible many times, which is awesome, continue to do so. Some of you are in that, that challenge still to read through the Bible all the way through. Keep that challenge. You need to do that regularly, reading through God's Word. But if you've done that, you'll know that there's something missing in the Bible, and that's hurry up, do it. In fact, there's only one thing that I find in the Bible that God says to hurry up and do, and that's be saved. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. On the other hand, what we find replete throughout the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, is wait. Wait on the Lord. God says it again and again and again. Why? Because we fight the proclivity to hurry up and do things hastily in the flesh. I love Isaiah 40 and verse 31. It says, they that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They that wait on the Lord will mount up like wings of eagles. They that wait on the Lord will run and not be weary. Those who wait on the Lord will walk and not be faint. It's important to wait. So chapter 16 of Genesis is really an object lesson of not walking in the flesh, but walking in the Spirit. All right, now you can go back to Genesis. And now we come to chapter 17. And some time has transpired, 13 years to be exact. Because we read verse 1, when Abram was 91, or 99 I should say, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. So, in chapter 16, Abram was 86, now he's 99, 13 years. 13 years of silence. And why is that? Because I think God wanted to get Abram to the place where it's like, man, 
there's no way I can do anything in my flesh. You know, I can't have a child. That's like ridiculous. Because God's going to tell him you are. In fact, notice that God says, I am almighty God. It's El Shaddai. I am the omnipotent, all-powerful God. And I want you to walk before me blameless. You know what the word means? It means to be complete or totally committed. And why does God say, I want you to be totally committed to me, Abram? Why? Because up to this point, he hasn't been totally committed. He's passed some tests, yes, but he's failed a lot. His walk has been, what we might say, inconsistent, right? So God says to him right now, now you need to walk to, with me blamelessly. You need to be fully committed, Abram. Why? Because I'm going to do a mighty work. That's why God introduces himself as the omnipotent one, El Shaddai, the all-powerful one. Why? Because he's going to point out to Abraham, guess what? That son that you've had for 13 years, Ishmael, that's not the son of promise. You and Sarai are going to have a child. Incredible. Because he says in verse 2, And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. So he reiterates the promise he made back in chapter 12. That was 25 years earlier. And we read that Abram fell on his face, and I love this, and God talked with him, which is pretty amazing. God talked with him. What's it like to hear from God audibly? I don't know. I've heard people say that they hear audibly from God. I don't know. I wouldn't be proud of it. Yeah, I was talking to God the other day. Really? Everybody I hear that when God talks and they fall on their face. That's what we find. Abram fell on his face. We're told in Psalm 29, verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful and majestic. How about that? I'm looking forward to hearing the voice of the Lord one day in heaven. That'd be awesome. But God speaks to Abram. And he says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, Abram. Can you imagine? I made a covenant with you. He did that in chapter 15. An unconditional covenant of grace. And you shall be a father of many nations. And now, verse 5, guess what? He changes his name. So here's the name change. No longer shall you be called Abram, exalted father, but your name shall be Abraham, which means a father of a multitude, for I've made you a father of many nations. So you're thinking, that is awesome. Good for you, Abraham. Well, listen, I don't think he's thrilled about the name change. I've got to tell you. In fact, I believe even his name Abram was more of a burden than a blessing. Why? Because, first of all, the name Abram means exalted father. Now understand, in the Middle Eastern culture, even to this day amongst Bedouin people, they're very hospitable. So imagine back then, Abram's living in the area, and he's traveling around in a tent with his, you know, caravan. And whenever he's settled someplace, he'd see other travelers coming by and being hospitable. He's inviting them, hey, have a drink of water. In fact, we see that in the next chapter. Stop by, have a drink of water. They're talking to one another. And in the conversation, they're exchanging one another's names. And someone says, well, what's your name? He says, my name is Abram. Oh, exalted father. Exalted father, really? How many kids do you have? Well, none yet. Hmm, okay. You're married, right? Oh, yeah, I'm married. In fact, we're, we're praying that my wife gets pregnant. Oh, that's great. How old's your wife? 75. Dude, you're one stick short of a kebab, right? That's what people would be thinking. And he's like, yeah, I know. But it's going to happen. And now God changes his name to the father of a multitude. Incredible, really? But you see, God wants him to start living up to his name. By the way, God wants us to live up to our names, right? God wants us to live up to our names. We have many name changes in the Bible, right? Many name changes in the Bible. And uh, you think about uh, Jacob to Israel. Think about Jesus said to Simon, your na name is now Peter. As Saul's name was changed to Paul. And God changes our names as well. God changes our names. Um, Think about this. There are many passages, but one of the names God calls you is a saint. How about that? You're now a saint. You're thinking, I'm not a saint, really? Oh, yeah, you're a saint. God calls you a son of God. God calls you a child of God. God calls you a child of the light. He calls you a living stone. He calls you, you know, a priest of God. That's pretty right. And he's asking you to live up to that because sometimes we're not living up to our name, right? He says, now you're Abraham. Verse 6, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Nations and kings, many kings, of course, but the greatest is Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come through the seed of Abraham. And I will establish my covenant between me and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant. 
This will not be avoided. This will happen. To be God to you and your descendants after you. I will also give you and your descendants after you the land which you are a stranger. You're a stranger now in this land, but I'm giving you all of the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. People are arguing about whose is it. Well, God says right here it's theirs, just so you know. And I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout your generations. So God is reaffirming this incredible covenant that he made with Abraham. He changes his name to prove that. And now he gives him a sign of the covenant. Verse 10. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign, there it is, of the covenant between me and you. This is not the covenant. This is a sign of the covenant. <clears throat> he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. In other words, anyone in your home, even a servant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now, notice here, for the very first time, Abraham is told about something to do. Prior to this, Abraham has done nothing. God says, I make a covenant with you. All you have to do is believe. In fact, it says that Abraham believed everything God said, and God imputed to him his righteousness. Uh, Abraham was saved, made right before God by faith. So, of course, we talked about this last time. Abraham is a perfect example in the Old Testament that we are saved by faith. However, we also know the statement, or at least I've said it many times before. We know that it is faith alone that saves but the faith that saves is never alone. In other words, it's you're saved by faith alone. But if you truly are saved, there's going to be evidence of that, right? And God now says, I want you to step at the plate. There's something I now want you to do, Abraham, to show everybody that you're different and your descendants are different. And that is, I want you to be circumcised. Now, this was a practice known at this time. But God is giving it spiritual significance. He wants all the nations around them to know that the descendants of God, the descendants of Abraham, those who follow God, don't walk according to the flesh. They're cutting off the flesh, and they're walking according to the Spirit. Warren Wearsby had a great commentary on this, and he says, Since God's covenant involved Abraham's seed, it was fitting that the mark of the covenant be on the male organ of that generation. Since all people are conceived in sin, this special mark would remind them that they were accepted by God because of His gracious covenant. End quote. Now, one of the problems is, is, again, this is not the covenant. It's a sign of the covenant. Unfortunately, one of the problems we see with the Jewish people <clears throat> over the years is they began to trust in the signs. They began to trust in the outward signs. Well, I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven. Why? I was circumcised. Well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Why? I, I perform sacrifices, right? Jeremiah the prophet had to address this in Jeremiah 4, 4. And he said to the people, circumcise yourselves. Take away the foreskin of your heart. That's what God cares about. It's good that you're outwardly circumcised. That's a sign, but that's not the covenant. God wants your heart. And of course, we know this was a problem during the time of Christ with the Pharisees. They said, oh, we do this, we do this, we do that. And Jesus says, yeah, but your heart is far from God. And so we know that there is this tendency within man to trust in a ritual and in religion rather than a relationship, right? And that can creep into the church. There are people who trust in rituals rather than the relationship. For example, we just had, I don't know how many water baptisms in our worship service. That was so awesome. Now understand this. These people that got water baptized this morning, they, they weren't saved because they were water baptized. Not a one of them. Not a one of them. We get water baptized as an outward sign that we were saved a time beforehand, right? Right? Listen, we're saved the moment we give our life to Jesus Christ, the moment we confess our sin and say, Lord, forgive me. I believe that you are God, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose from the dead. I commit my life to you. Come into my heart. I want to follow you, Jesus. I'm committed to you. That moment that we step up to the plate by faith and embrace him as our Savior, we're saved. So water baptism is simply a sign of something that God already did. But we're declaring to everybody, hey, I'm, I'm following the Savior. 
Unfortunately, there are people that actually trust. I've, I've talked to people over the years. Are you saved? Oh, yeah, I was, I was water baptized, you know, when I was, you know, seven years old, blah, 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 you know. Or, <clears throat> wow. You're trusting in a ritual. You're trusting, trusting in a sign. Very, very dangerous. So, nonetheless, the covenant was with Abraham, and God says, this is what I want you to do to show everybody you don't walk according to the flesh. That was the sign of circumcision. Now, verse 15, then God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall no longer call her Sarai, which means contention, by the way, but Sarah shall be her name, and that means princess. So she definitely got an upgrade on name, right? She went from miscontention to, to the princess. That, that's definitely an upgrade big time. And I'll bless her and also give you a son by her. Princess is going to have a kid. Then I will bless her, and she shall be the mother of nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Now, this is a, a you know, he, God had told him that before, but it's, it's, he's now beginning to sink in. You're a lot older, dude, and yet your wife's going to have a kid. And notice how he responds, because that's just a lot to take in. Abraham fell on his face, and he laughed. And he said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Are you kidding me, God? That, that is funny. Now, some commentators say, well, you know, Abraham was laughing out of excitement. Yay! <clears throat> because God doesn't rebuke him, as he does later with Sarah. But, but notice the next phrase that runs right into it, though. The problem is this. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Here, here's what Abraham's doing, at least as far as I can see. God says, you're going to have a child at 100 years old. And Abraham says, God, you've got to be kidding me. That, that's hilarious. <laughs> There's Ishmael right there. May he live before you. God, look at that. i got a 13-year-old. Come on. He, he's yours, Lord. And notice what God says. God said, verse 19, no. No. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him him so here abraham laughs kind of <clears throat> you know in a funny way but ironically god says and by the way here's the name of your kid isaac it means laughter and you'd laugh too if you had a kid at 190 right or most likely you'd cry i i cry right <sighs> you're kidding me now i will say this and we do need to point this out because the bible does that after this incident, Abraham did believe God. He was resilient. He was blameless in his faith. He did totally trust in God. And we read of this in Romans chapter 4. I'll just read it to you. We have a commentary on this. This is Romans 4 beginning in verse 18. It says, Speaking of Abraham, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, Abraham did not consider his own body already dead since he was already a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. But at now he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But now he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced, in other words, blameless, that what God had promised, God would perform. So Abraham came a long way, and now he begins to trust God. And God... Now speaks to him about Ishmael in verse 20. And as for Ishmael, I've heard you. I know you love this son. I mean, that's your son. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly. Again, reiterating the prophecy God gave to Hagar. And he shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. And again, that, that promise, that prophecy is fulfilled through the Arab nations. But, verse 21, my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. <clears throat> so you're going to be 100. She's going to be 90. Trust me. And, and, and why does God wait so long? I'll tell you why. Because God wants everybody to know, the nations around him, forever and throughout history, that that child is born of supernatural means. And that that nation, the nation of Israel, is born by supernatural means and that we serve a supernatural God. Nothing's impossible with him. That's the point. Then he finished talking with him and God went up from Abraham. So God takes off. And Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all who were born in his house and all who were brought, are bought with money, every male among the men of Abraham's house. That would be all the servants as well. 
and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day as God sent them. So he didn't mess around. That very day, let's do it. Let's be obedient. He was a doer of the word. And Abraham was 99 years old. Commentary. Ouch. When he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael's son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised, and his son Ishmael and all the men of his house, born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So he obeys God. Now, we aren't under such mandate as the Jewish people were. But spiritually, we are. Spiritually, we need to be careful. God says, I need you to cut away the flesh because you made a mistake in the flesh. You birthed an Ishmael. And we could tend to do that too. So God says, cut away the flesh, walk in the spirit. Jesus addressing this issue said in John 6, 33, it is the spirit that gives life and the flesh profits nothing. The flesh doesn't profit a few things, uh, uh, most things, nothing. All right, now we come to chapter 18. Then the Lord appeared to him by the Tiberith trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent in the heat of the day. So this is not shortly after. It's now maybe a day later or something. It's now the middle of the day. It's hot. And he, that's Abraham, lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, three men were standing by him. <clears throat> and when he saw him, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now find, found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please, let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I'll bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you've come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. So here you have Abraham showing Middle Eastern hospitality. He sees these travelers coming by and says, come over here. Let me give you water. Let me wash your feet, prepare a meal from you. Now, as the text unfolds, we come to find out that <clears throat> two of these men are angels and one is God. Imagine that. Entertaining God and angels. Now, there's a great verse that's for us in Hebrews 13, 2. It says this, just in a list of things that we as believers ought to do, it also says this, and don't forget to entertain strangers. Don't forget to be hospitable to people you come across that you may not even know. For in doing so, some have unknowingly entertained angels, which is exactly what Abraham does here. You never know who you're going to run into. You, they might be an angel, they're here and they're gone, or who knows, you might be able to lead these people to Christ, talk to about the Lord. All right, so in verse 6, Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. Then Abraham ran to the herd and took a tender and good calf, gave it to the young man and hastened to prepare it. Then he took butter and milk and a calf which he had prepared, and he set it before them and stood by them under the tree as they ate. So because we know that this is the Lord, we know that Abraham here is serving the Lord, though he only finds that out later. And, and I simply would just would want to pull out a few things that I see here that would be good for us to do in our service to the Lord. One thing I love about Abraham here is I notice that Abraham's service to the Lord is zealous. I mean, in verse 2, he, he doesn't wait at his tent. He runs to meet them. In verse 6, he hurries to the tent to get Sarah. In verse 7, he, he runs to the herd. He hastens to make a meal. I, I love that. I love the fact that, you know, his service to God wasn't, well, like, if I get a free chance, I'll go to church on Sunday. I don't know. Golf's coming on pretty soon. You know how exciting golf is. <laughs> he's up to the, you know, he's rock coming up to the ninth hole. <laughs> He's about what, what butter is he going to use? I can't believe it. What is with golf? I'm sorry. I know we have a lot of <laughs> golfers here. So I like into sports like the martial arts and stuff like that. Golf, I thought the best sport would be, you know, uh, ultimate golf. And the golfers run, they go, and they pound one. I don't know. This is just making up sports. Sorry. <laughs> golf is so boring. Anyway, we make up excuses of why we can't come to church. Or it's football. When football, see, I understand that, but... That's, that's not being zealous for the Lord. I love the fact that Abraham, this is the Lord. Let me do it. Let's, what can I, he's enthusiastic. A second thing I see here is that his service was generous. In verse 6, he makes a good meal. Uh, in verse 7, the meat was tender. It was good. And I think anything that we give to the Lord should be our best. Don't give him your leftovers of service. 
Man, there's some people here that serve at our church, and I have to say, stop, stop it, you're doing too much. You're here all the time, you're going to burn out. And others are like, where are you? Where are you? Sometimes you're here, and that's awesome, but we need to serve the Lord. Give to Him. Make it your best. Be generous in your giving to Him. And then one last thing I see about Abraham's service is that was humble. In verse 2, he bowed himself to the ground. In verses 3 through 5, he calls himself a servant, though he's the head of the home. And in verse 8, he doesn't sit down and eat. He stands to make sure that these honored guests are taken care of. And I, I, I just love that. I love the fact that these are things that we should see in our service to the Lord. Our service to God should be zealous. It should be generous. It should be humble. Now, <clears throat> verse 9. Then they said to him, that's to Abraham, where is Sarah your wife? So he said, well, she's here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife shall have a son. Now, Sarah was listening in the tent door, which is behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. Sarah had been past the age of childbearing. We talked about that earlier. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I've grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And would I have the pleasure of giving birth to a child? Are you kidding? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely I shall bear a child since I'm old? Right? And then we read this. God says, this is God saying, is anything too hard for the Lord? I think that's a verse you ought to underline. You ought to put the explosions next to it in your Bible. Right? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? That is such a good question to ask ourselves because so many of us here are facing adversity. We're facing things that we don't know what's going to happen next. Maybe it's your job. How's God going to provide? At one time it was providing. It's not providing now. Things have changed. Or maybe I've been trying. I'm not even using my skill that God, and I'm hoping for this other job. I've been waiting for the longest time. Could God even do that? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Or what about those family members you've wanted to be seen, uh, to be saved, I should say. It's, it's been years, maybe it's decades. I know about that. And you're thinking, will God ever change their heart? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Or maybe it's your marriage. You know, God, we, we, need, we need you to intervene in our marriage, God. This is hard. It's getting difficult. It's rough. We, are, what are we going to do? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Nothing's too hard for the Lord, right? In fact, in Ephesians 3.20, it says God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think. So you're thinking about what can God do? And God says, yeah, I can do more than that. Trust me. In fact, I love what Jesus said in Luke 18.27. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. God, help us then to not look at our circumstance with human eyes, but to trust him by faith. Nothing is too hard with the Lord. Just come to him. Now, God tells Abraham in verse 14, he continues, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. You don't think it's possible, but it is. She's going to have a son at 90 years old. Amazing. <clears throat> but Sarah denied it, saying, I, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, you did laugh, right? <laughs> you did. So she had a lapse of faith, and, and she comes clean. I, what I love the fact is both Abraham and Sarah both laughed, and God continued to fulfill his covenant with them. God forgave them. And I find that to be encouraging, that God overlooks those times where we faint in our faith. As long as we say, Lord, I'm sorry I blew it. I'm going to trust you. So God continued to do what he said. Now, verse 16, the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. So uh, the Lord departs. Abraham is now following. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So God is, you know, speaking on the way, and he's saying, you know, I don't think I could withhold this from Abraham. So he begins to share with him. The Lord said in verse 20, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, <clears throat> but Abraham stood before the Lord. So the two angels take off toward Sodom, and God stays, stays there, and Abraham is with them. 
And it says that Abraham came near. So he comes near to God and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, here we have Abraham communing with God, talking with God, drawing near to God, and what he's doing is he's interceding. So you could actually say this is intercession. Here we have, in fact, Abraham interceding for this local city that's a wicked city. And he's going to intercede with God for these people. James 5.16 says the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. So this is really a, a prayer, a request, even a haggling with God. Abraham asked God in verse 24, Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, Lord, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God, I know, what if there are 50 righteous there? I know, I know that you'd spare the city. And, and, of course, God is gracious. So gracious, so patient, right? We read in 2 Peter 3, 9 that the Lord is not willing that any person, not one person would perish, but all would come to repentance. We, we read of the heart of God in Ezekiel 33 and verse 11 that says, I, the Lord, have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would turn and live. So the Lord says to him, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And now Abram begins to now haggle with God. So, 50 righteous, I'll spare the city. But this gets really good. I mean, now you see, you know, well, you see where it comes from. Now you say, well, they, they, they are equipped. When we told, went with our team to Israel about haggling, we kind of gave them a whole little, little schooling on haggling, right? And haggling because this is part of their culture. So this is now what Abraham does. So I need to get my Jewishness on right now. <clears throat> so Abraham said in verse 27, Indeed now, I am but thus the ashes. Have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than fifty righteous. Would you destroy all the city for the lack of five? God says, if I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose there should be forty found. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of forty. And he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty should be found there. He said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, indeed, now I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Oh, my. Oh. Suppose 20 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. And he said, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak once more, God. Suppose 10 should be found there. And God said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. Now, forgive me for my bad accent. That was not that great. But think about this. He gets God all the way down to 10. And listen, Abraham truly believes. Wait a second. Lot lives in Sodom. And you have Lot and his wife, and Lot has two daughters. There's four. Certainly, four people, four believers living in that city over a short, you know, over a, well, somewhat of a period of time, at least made some impact. There'll at least be s at least six people that have been impacted by them. But not true. We get to the next chapter, that's it. Just four people, and they're not even doing well themselves. So verse 33, the Lord went his way, and as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So next week, we go on to see what happens with Sodom and Gomorrah. But here, we really do see so many great examples that we could take home. I, I think, well, just two that I will mention as we close. The first would be, not walking according to the flesh. Man, we got to make a commitment as believers. I can't live according to the flesh. I can't make fleshly decisions, knee-jerk reactions, acting hastily. I need to pray. I need to wait on God. I need to walk in the Spirit so that I don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, right? And then secondly, to realize, wait a second, the things that I'm struggling with, is there anything too difficult for the Lord? Nothing. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. So I know we have some things that are facing us, each and every one of us, different dynamics. And we're like, God, what are you going to do? We, I, I need you to respond. I need you to work. Trust, wait, and know that nothing is too difficult for him. So let's pray.